9-11, and there's a lot on everybody's minds. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about preparedness. Uh, my name is Tim Hooker. I'm with the Office of Emergency Management here for Rutherford County. We cover the county in its entirety. Uh, and you may wonder what emergency management does. And the best way I can explain it to you is up on the federal level, you have the agency that everybody's familiar with called FEMA. FEMA. And then down at the state level, you have the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, or TEMA. We are the local version of the above aforementioned uh, local emergency management runs things here locally. So what we do, uh, you know, most people say, oh, FEMA, you guys, and uh, I wish all we did was chase tornadoes, that would be good, because we'd only be busy typically in, in spring. <laughs> but uh, we do a whole lot across this county on a daily basis. Uh, we work with uh, and train uh, uh, response agencies, fire, police, EMS across the county. We work with them on a daily basis. We respond to emergencies all the way from catastrophic events like uh, tornadoes and flooding. Uh, all the way down to daily events where you might have multiple uh, vehicle accidents or multiple casualties may be involved or mm -hmm. gas leaks, hazardous materials or one of our chronic concerns, things of that sort. Uh, so across the board, when we think about preparedness, it's something that most folks don't think of on a regular basis until what happens? Until something happens. Complacency is what throws people off and makes them unprepared because they think, oh, well, it'll never happen to me, or it never happens here, or I've never seen it happen here in the 30 years I've lived here. How many of you have watched tornado footage of people standing in a damaged zone saying, well, I've lived here for 20 years, and I've gone through a Category 4 before, and it's never done this before, and he turns around and their house is gone? Storms and disasters are selected, and they hit you when they hit you they won't when they won't. But the important thing to remember is not to become complacent and to try to think ahead of the box and try to be prepared for when those moments do occur so you can more properly respond to the needs of yourself and your family, the people that live with you or the people that work with you. Mm -hmm. Because it's critical in knowing what to do when it comes to those steps. And there's a lot of information outside of what I provide today. There's a lot of information online that you can find about preparedness. You'll get all kinds of different stories. So my advice would be to pick and choose what best fits you in that realm and take it to the level that you need to. Because you can be just a daily prepared family uh, where you have emergency kits and a certain amount of supplies, which we recommend is a 72-hour cache of items and supplies that you need to get you through the minimum of three days before help can arrive uh, at your location. Um, up to, if you wanna get into real deep, what we call the preppers, who are digging underground shelters in their backyards and they're putting a year and a half worth of food in it and all that good stuff. So it just depends on the level you wanna go with it. <laughs> so across the board, preparedness, is defined by the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA as a continuous cycle of planning, organizing, training, equipping, exercising, evaluating, and taking corrective actions in an effort to ensure effective coordination during an incident response. We in the emergency management field are primarily responsible for the preparedness of public safety agencies to appropriately respond to incidents of great magnitude or disaster within the county. And it's a continuous cycle. Um, as far as state and federal requirements go, we have an emergency operations plan uh, that has to be approved by the state and the federal government. And we mirror each other across the board. So the state has to approve our plan and it has to be rewritten and revised every five years. However, it's a living and breathing document. That doesn't mean that Tim goes into his office uh, on month 11 before the end of the five years and retweets the plan. It's a constant living, breathing document that's under constant scrutiny and change. So uh, 
I just got that the, the new update done last year. I'm in the middle of working our, on our mitigation plan right now, which is due in March of next year. So if I started on it several months ago. It's a long process. It's very tedious. Um, mitigation is part of that preparedness where we look at specific uh, areas of concern that routinely receive disastrous consequences when something happens on a regular basis, i.e., we have some areas in this county that tend to flood when we have just a little teeny bit of rain, just a little flood. Oh, we got an inch of rain. Most people go, oh good, my yard needed that. Other people are going, well, my yard's flooded again. Uh, and it becomes more disastrous as we get large scale events like Waverly just went through. Um, although that was, uh, I think, a thousand year flood, uh, it's not often one uh, area gets a front and comes in and stalls and dumps 17 inches of rain in one place. It's kind of what happened in 2010, but if you remember 2010 when parts of northern Rutherford County and Davidson County and Cheatham County and on down the river got flooded, uh, that was that was 16 inches of rain. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of issues there. But the biggest thing you can do in your preparedness is to understand the common threats that you live in and that, that routinely affect our area. And we do this on a regular basis as well. Um, we do studies uh, and, and uh, make sure that what we have is problematic is documented so we can understand because history is what makes us prepared. If we know an area floods on a routine basis, we're going to try to get a mitigation plan going together where we typically, a typical mitigation plan is we've had several projects in the county where a, a neighborhood routinely floods. And every couple of years we're going out there and putting our responders in harm's way to get a raft and go out and take people out of high water. Uh, and then once the water goes down, damage assessments occur and all that stuff. This happens over and over and over again, what we call repetitive losses. So we do a study to see if the cost benefit analysis would allow us to go in for a mitigation grant to actually use federal dollars matched by state dollars and county dollars to go in and buy this neighborhood, knock down the houses, and return the area back to its natural wetland state that it was designed to be in in the first place and just turn it into a grassy area or a park and you, you may have seen some of these places not even realize if you drive by uh, one area is off a fortress um, by an apartment complex right next to a creek that used to flood routinely and still does but nothing was built there uh, and there's a park there and a nice walkway. So when the floodwaters come up, the only thing that happens is the walkway gets a little mud on it and the water goes down, clean that off. Nobody's house got flooded. Everybody's happy. Right. So, like I said, emergency management is responsible for coordination of emergency activities within Rutherford County. It includes coordination of public and private emergency services providers, planning, development, training, public education to save lives and protect property from the effects of major emergencies or disasters. Um, it is comprehensive. We like to call it all hazards. At first, emergency management was born in the 1950s out of the civil defense program. Some of you may be as old as me um, and remember the old uh, triangle with the CD in the middle of it, civil defense, born out of the Cold War era. Um, emergency management was actually born out of civil defense. Um, now it's all hazards where it's not just having to worry about duck and cover under your desk during a nuclear holocaust, uh, but all hazards meaning chemical, biological, nuclear, uh, natural disasters, man-made disasters, technological disasters, everything comprehensive. So, our four primary phases of preparedness are mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. We work all these four phases uh, throughout emergency, the, the management of responding to emergencies across the county on a regular basis. 
Uh, like I said, our plans are to provide a uniform and structured guideline for emergency response. Uh, establishes lines of responsibility and authority within the jurisdiction uh, and advise, uh, identifies risks and hazards and uh, also identifies resources that we can utilize. So in essence what happens is the federal government has an, NF, an NRP, a National Response Plan, and the state uses their guidelines based on that criteria, although the state has their own standalone emergency operations plan. The, uh, Tennessee has one of the most robust emergency operations plan in the nation. Um, as a matter of fact, it's been modeled by numerous other states as an example, so it's, it's, it's very robust. Uh, as far as it goes on the county's responsibilities is that we mirror the state's plan. In other words, our format is the same across the board. And what makes that magic is it doesn't matter where Tim Hooker goes. Let's say I get called on mutual aid to a large scale disaster or in Waverly or in East Tennessee at fires in Gatlinburg or take your pick where Tim might end up as a mutual aid call, an asset to go in and help out other jurisdictions. Their plan <coughs> is pretty much the same as my plan. I know how to work it because it looks similar to me because we mirror what the state does. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changes from county to county is the assets that are available. So it makes it easier to work with. We work on a function called Emergency Support Functions, or ESFs. And I'm sorry, we're acronym heavy in this business, so if I spit an acronym out and you don't know it, uh, I, I always try to expound. But Emergency Support Functions, there are currently 16 of them. We're looking at adding a 17th which would be a cyber element. Uh, and then I'm also talking to the state about adding an 18th, which is a financial element as well. But it goes from transportation. Why would, why would you think transportation would be number one? How do you get supplies? Well, transportation is number one is because when we have an impact in an area, if we don't handle transportation, our assets can't get in and out. We can't help you. That's why it's so important for you on the preparedness side to look at that 72 hour kit because typically in Tennessee it doesn't happen. Now you get into these larger areas like California where the earth opens up and you got bridges that are down, you have earthquakes and wildfires and good gosh, they're going crazy with wildfires out west right now. But it's typical for communities out there to be separated from uh, government support for weeks, maybe months in some places, because of the, uh, the catastrophic event that occurs. So being able to sustain yourself until help can get there is huge, and that's, that's a big piece of, it, of sustainability and, and preparedness. Next comes communications. Um, it is the backbreaker of all response across any jurisdiction in the United States. Transportation is always, the fa or communication is always the failure in what we do. Every time we exercise, every time we have a live event, if somebody picks the number one issue that we've had across the board, it's always communications. Uh, and we work on it, work on it, work on it, and there's always room for improvement. Um, we do have a brand new communication uh, system that's countywide now that's vastly improved our local capabilities to communicate uh, across the board. So that's been a huge uh, game changer for us here. Uh, three is infrastructure, and that goes all the way from our public works to uh, our information technology, uh, GIS, analyzation, uh, engineering, all of those facets fall underneath infrastructure. ESF4 is firefighting which isn't just a standalone element anymore, they're also comprehensive, whereas they don't just fight fires anymore, they're medical first responders, they're urban search and rescue teams, they're special confined space, high angle, low angle, confined space, underwater search and rescue and recovery, uh, 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 collapsed, uh, just a whole plethora of stuff that fire is doing 
uh, information and planning, human services, resource support, health and medical services, and that is also split between uh, public health and our EMS division, which is North Emergency Medical Services. Uh, ESF-9 is search and rescue. Uh, 10 is environmental response or hazardous materials. Uh, ESF-11 is food. 12 is energy. 13 is law enforcement. 14 is donations of volunteers, which we're talking about uh, support from this church and others for volunteer organizations to help us in support of recovery operations when we have a large scale disaster. Because one thing that we depend on and that we know and understand is that Tennessee indeed is the volunteer state. When we have an impact, people show up. Usually whether you ask them to or not, but they show up. <laughs> the issue with what we call spontaneous volunteers is they're always welcome and appreciated, but they can become part of the problem. That's why we try to organize them into an element where we can define what their capabilities are, define what the needs are in the field, and match those two elements and provide service towards recovery. In other words, if you guys send a batch of people over to what we call a volunteer coordination center, and Fred and Bill and Mary and Ted walk in and say, hey, we got chainsaws in the pickup truck, we'd like to help. So we've all of a sudden got a chainsaw crew, we establish a team leader, we give them an assignment, and we may send them out to Miss Smith's yard to cut trees off of her driveway, or help move debris to the roadway so it could be collected by county solid waste to start clearing debris and getting the area back open so we can work on getting power restored and water fixed and gas leaks fixed and all the things that come in the glory of a disaster. Uh, so that's that. Uh, recovery is also part of that. 16 is animals. Oh, there's a ESF for animals? Yeah, you bet. They're living, breathing creatures and they can become a part of the problem as well, especially when you have a large impact and you got animals roaming around everywhere. Um, it, it, it goes without saying that they need help too. We've got resources and teams that can come in and provide support uh, just for animals all the way to um, one of our key forces. We've got a, a mutual aid agreement, a state to state MOU with the Gulf states. Uh, so when they evacuate uh, for hurricanes, uh, a lot of them will be transported into Tennessee to be sheltered. You're familiar with this anyway. Um, one of the first ones I worked here in Rutherford County was Katrina in 2005. Uh, and I'll never forget, we weren't prepared on the side when these federal planes start landing at Smyrna Base and people are coming off an airplane and there's a dog and there's a cat and there's a parrot and there's a monkey and there's a, swear to goodness, a chicken. Uh, it's, 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 it's like, hold on, we got to do something about all these animals because we can't let them in the shelter with people. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we know, we're working ESF 16 of getting temporary sheltering set up, kennels for the dogs, food, where we can set up a temporary outside kennel outside of the human shelter so we can take care of the animal health. Because it's hard because I know every one of you, how many have a pet? They're family, aren't they? And it's, and it's hard to say, excuse me, ma'am, I need you to leave your home. Uh, and, and, and more so than not, you'll get, I'll be glad to leave, but I'm not leaving my dog at home. Or my cat's coming with me. Because here's the thing, legally, we can't make people leave. Uh, it's up to the individual whether they decide to evacuate or not. When they say mandatory evacuation, that's saying you must leave. Yeah, for your own well-being and, and well, for your own good, you should leave. There are ways around it, especially when, when they go door to door. And sometimes we have to get rough with people, uh, unfortunately. But sometimes it takes a kick to get people motivated because we know a 15-foot wall of water is headed their way or hazardous materials plume is headed towards their house and we say 
very sorry, but you're going to need to evacuate. I need you to go this way if you're unsafe. I'm not leaving. Okay. Would you mind giving me the name of your next kin? Oh, well, maybe, maybe I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it takes that extra kick to motivate folks. But when we say leave, there's a reason. We're not just playing around. Uh, then we have other annexes, we weapons of mass destruction and terrorism annex. Uh, like I said, we work with natural, man-made, and technological disasters. Weather's always our number one factor. Why? Because it's history. We plan for what we know and what history tells us. And what history tells us for the area that we live in is what's our number one threat in Rutherford County. Tornadoes. Tornadoes. Wind-driven weather, rain, flooding, snow, <laughs> sleet, hail, severe thunderstorms. Is that a threat? Why are, are th severe thunderstorms a threat? Well, that and they're always the breed to tornadic activity. You're never going to have a tornado without thunderstorms first. They don't just pop out of the sky. Um, so, weather is critical here. Thunderstorms. Now, let me uh, explain a little bit about the difference between watches and warnings. When you hear the Weather Service and the TV say watches and warnings, this is what it means. A watch means that conditions are favorable for those conditions to exist. So, what that should tell you in your preparedness activity is, oh, I need to pay attention to the weather I need to look outside. I need to make sure my apps on my phone are working. I need to watch the news. I need to monitor. I need to make sure the, the batteries in my no weather radio are, are up and functioning. Um, there are multiple means to get notifications today. In my opinion, there's no reason for the public to say, well, I have no idea. Because you can't have an idea. I, you know, I know even some of the most poor, downtrodden families will still have a 16-year-old with a smartphone. <laughs> uh, so there, there are multiple means to get notified for these things. Warning indicates that these conditions can develop or could develop within minutes, or they're ongoing now. They're either spotted by trained weather spotters, or their Doppler radar indicated out of the NOAA Weather Service. They may or not be happening, but it's saying that uh, indications are saying that they will be there or they will develop. Uh, understand, too, that it's not necessarily site-specific to where you are. Because a lot of people get misunderstandings when they talk about weather and their predictions. When you wake up in the morning and turn on the TV and they say, oh, there's a 30% chance of rain today, are you expecting rain? Typically, I'm not. 30%, at 30%. Now, if they say 15, 20%, <laughs> it's probably gonna, because <laughs> that's just the way it works. <laughs> but what that 30% or that 40% or that 50% means is that odds are half of you may get rain within the viewing area. And Middle Tennessee goes all the way down to the Alabama line and all the way up into Kentucky. So they could say 40% chance of rain today, and then it rains down in Lewisburg for five minutes. Guess what? They were right. <laughs> so pay attention to the weather. Uh, tornadoes. We don't like them. They're a fact of life. <coughs> Tornado Alley uh, has moved pretty much south and east from where it used to be in the Kansas area uh, into Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. We see more of them. We see more catastrophic storms. Uh, it chalk it up to global warming. I, I, I don't know, but it's just, it's happened over the years. It's, it's slowly moved this way. Typically, our most active area is in April. Spring is, is when you can expect them. However, don't rule out 
the real uh, possibility that tornadoes in the state of Tennessee can happen any time. I saw one off my back porch in January one year. It was 20 degrees outside and there was a tornado off my back porch. I'm like, what month is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, they're rated from, uh, this is a little bit old here. There used to be an F scale, now it's an EF scale. Enhanced fajita scale is what they call it. So an EF zero, yeah, there's actually a category for a tornado that ranks zero. In my view, zero means nothing. There wasn't anything, it wasn't a tornado. Mm -hmm. But a zero means anything less than 73 miles an hour. So if you have some minimal damage in your house, some limbs knocked down, maybe a few shingles missing, and we go out and examine it along with the weather service. I said, well, it looks like this type of damage didn't get anything above 73 miles an hour, so this is an EF zero tornado. Uh, all the way up to uh, an ESF five, which is winds of upwards 318 miles an hour. This is, this is past hurricane winds, okay? We were looking at winds that topped out at 130 miles an hour with Ida that just came through. So that would be the equivalent of an EF2 tornado. So what makes Ida and hurricanes more prolific is it's not quick lived like tornadoes are. The tornadoes move and they jump around. I like to actually call them living, breathing beings because they expand and contract and they jump, they go up, they come back down. I'll give you an example. Um, the 2009 EF4 uh, that came through here. When I did the first flyover the next morning, I thought it was only 11 miles long because we started at damage and we ended at damage with an aerial overfly. And I counted houses out, out of the photographs that I took. And we didn't realize until we started getting more reports that this was bigger than we thought. And it actually went from Eagleville to Las Casas. It was 23 miles long. But the thing was, from the aerial view that we saw once we flew the whole pattern, was it picked up. There may be a half a mile of no damage. And then it would set back down again. And it would hop, skip, and jump all the way across the county. So it's kind of crazy. But when you start hearing these watches and warnings is when you need to start paying attention to your surroundings and making sure that you're prepared to take those steps in place to protect you and your family. Yes, ma'am. Has there ever been like an EF5 uh, where it's 300, over 300 miles per hour? Yes, but not in Tennessee. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, watch means the uh, same thing for watches with thunderstorms and warnings for thunderstorms, same thing for tornadoes as well. So precautions. In a house with a basement, avoid windows, get indoors, uh, get under some kind of sturdy protection, heavy table or workbench, cover yourself with a mattress or sleeping bag, know where heavy objects rest on the floor above you, Pianos, refrigerators, water bread beds. I don't think those are popular anymore. Um, <laughs> um, do not go underneath them. They may fall through a weakened floor. Uh, in a house with no basement, a dorm, or an apartment, avoid windows. Go to the lowest floor possible. A small center room away from outside doors and windows. Numerous times on every storm, uh, impacted area I've gone into, you have seen over and over again damaged structures where the walls are gone, the roofs are gone, but guess what's still standing? The interior closet or the interior bathroom. And that's the places you need to get. Um, if, you, if you have a basement, go down. You, you, tornadoes, severe wind events, go to the lowest area possible. I have a question. Yes. Because I'm new to the area, yeah. and I noticed that these houses here, compared to Florida, where I come from, have like a crawl space. Yeah. Is that safe to go into if you hear of a tornado coming through? If you can get into it. 
Now, getting into a crawl space may make the situation worse for you. All right. Now, for instance, my 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 house, which is one of the reasons I bought it, is on a four foot foundation. And I have an interior closet that the floor opens up and I can go down into that foundation and it's surrounded by a brick oak block that's filled with concrete and rebar and a quarter inch steel plate over the top of it. That's my safe room. Right. Um, in Rutherford County, we maintain a, a safe room roster. And we say safe room, it's not just for uh, somebody breaking in on you in the middle of the night and having a safe place to go. It's safe for weather preparedness, all that stuff too. So we uh, ask people to call us and give us a specific piece of information on where your safe room is located in your house, what side it's located on, is it above ground, below ground, what's it made out of, um, and where it's exactly located in the house. In the garage, uh, in an interior room, on what side of the house. Reason being is if your area is impacted, we can look at this roster and concentrate on houses that we know have these in place because odds are you may go into them and odds are extremely high you're going to survive, but the odds are also high you may be trapped because you may have debris across the door, the ceiling, and you may not be able to get out. If you crawl down in a crawl space, you're probably going to be safe. You may be safe. I can't guarantee that. But can you get out? If you crawl on your belly to get under a crawl space, can you crawl back out? So that's something you're going to have to take on your own course. Um, it depends on the structure and how it's built as well. Uh, you know, mobile homes, I'm sorry to say this, there's no safe place. Um, if you're house has any kind of mitigative construction, uh, uh, you know, extra bracing and things of that sort through construction, it's more possible. I've seen houses completely obliterated and nothing but a few blocks standing. And I've seen houses with nothing but the first floor wide open. So I can't say, yeah, no, you're going to be safe. Uh, if it comes to that, maybe consider having one dug in your backyard or having a, a hardened uh, shelter put in your garage, or they have a new process now where you can dig one out of your garage and you just slide the door open and go down in the garage. Any other questions? So, uh, like I said, modular and mobile homes, you don't have a, ch a chance if you, if you get out try to go to a neighborhood's house, a neighbor's house that may be more hardened, or another location if you've got time. The danger about tornadoes is typically you don't have time because they can drop out of the sky. You don't know, it may be the first time it hits ground may be right in your neighborhood. The thing you don't want to be doing is out driving around trying to find a safe place when you've got stuff lying around because what's the number one killer of a tornado? Debris. Flying debris. <clears throat> Flying debris. So you don't want to be out in it. Uh, I'll give you an example too that I've got lots of stories but let's go back to the uh, 2009 F4. Or, yeah, 2009. Um, when <laughs> Everybody remembers that famous picture of the tornado past, uh, with uh, Bumpus Harley in the, in the background. You see the big tornado. When it was coming up Thompson Lane, there was a lady with her daughter in the car that pulled into a two-story office building and had the wherewithal to get out of the car and run inside the building into a bathroom where they literally squeezed in. There were about 15 other people in this bathroom but that's the place they should have been. After the storm passed, when they came out, the entire second floor of that building, gone. They went out into the parking lot where she parked. There was a four by four post that was driven all the way through the passenger into the driver compartment of the car. Had they stayed in that vehicle, they probably not, would not be with us today. So that's what I mean by you don't need to be out in them. So have a plan. 
if you live in a modular or mobile home, have a plan of somewhere you could go, monitor enough. There are a lot of times where you do have time to plan, but it depends on where the storm is and its proximity to where you're located. This is where your preparedness on knowledge on these watches and warnings comes into play because if you hear when you get up in the morning the news saying, hey, we may have some severe weather today, these are the chances, this is when you need to start looking at, okay, maybe I need to call Mary down the street and, and see if we can go over there when I get home from work or whatever the case may be. Uh, a lot of times when they start, remember, our severe weather typically comes from the southwest and goes to the northeast. So it's coming out of the Eagleville area, but you'll see it track across the state and come across uh, Williamson County and, and uh, Marshall County, all down there, and move up this way. So you've got time to see the pattern of the storms and what's, what's going on there. Uh, office buildings, this is Clarksville, Tennessee. That's, that's, that's their main government office building. Um, it was survivable on the lower floors, but it was, it was completely destroyed. Um, but again, everything points to center of the building, as low as you can get, away from doors, glass, windows, things of that sort. Uh, vehicles, if you're called out, um, there's no safe option. Uh, if it's visible, get as far away as you can if you can by moving at right angles to the tornado. Seek shelter in a sturdy building if possible. If you're caught by extreme winds or flying debris, park the car as quickly as possible. Uh, stay in your car with the seatbelt on. Put your head down below the windows. Cover your head with your hands, a blanket, coat, uh, the cushion. Or if you can safely uh, get noticeably lower levels, such as a ditch next to the roadway, leave your car in a line in an area, cover your head with your hands and avoid uh, seeking shelter underneath bridges and overpasses. You've heard a lot of people going to bridges and overpasses trying to get out of it. Not good, because uh, those high winds and circulating winds can create a vacuum and pull people right out of it. Um, in your plans, what you want to do is identify a rally point. So if you work somewhere, it's good to talk to your organizational structure about this and say, hey, do we have an emergency plan? I've never seen it. What is it? What does it look like? Where's the rally point? What are we supposed to do if there's a fire? Or what are we supposed to do if, the, if there's a hazardous materials event and we're told to evacuate? Where do we go? What do we do? Uh, identify a rally point. That's a place where you and your family will meet. There's a house fire or some emergency where you live. Say, hey, Joe, Frank, and Mary, when, when there's a house fire, we get out of the house and we'll go to the left corner of the backyard. That's what everybody will meet. And if you get to the left corner of the backyard and everybody's there but one person, you know you've got one missing and you got to figure out what's going on with that one person. Uh, Know how to shut off your utilities, gas, water, and electricity, if you have the luxury of being able to do that before you evacuate. Uh, have a plan of wherever you will go, family or friends. Uh, if you don't have a place, officials may activate a shelter. I'll call Emily in the middle of the night and say, guess what? This is happening. I want you to be prepared. I can't, I'm sorry, Emily Gerard is in the back. She's our Red Cross representative. Um, be prepared, we might have to open up a shelter tonight. Um, we're looking at, well, it wasn't too long ago when we had a bunch of winter weather coming through and we were anticipating having to open up several shelters uh, for that. Um, all the way to, I mean, Emily does it on a regular basis. We have a house fire, they're always housing people uh, for sheltering. Um, have a go kit with essential needs ready to take. Uh, if you have a shelter, register it with emergency management. So just give us a call. We'll take your information and put you on that roster. Our office number is 898-7764. Flooding. Same thing with 
severe stuff, thunderstorm warnings and tornado watches and warnings. You have flood watches and warnings. Same nomenclature. If there's a watch, it indicates that it may occur. If there's a warning, that means it's occurring. Now, inherently, over and over again, more people die in flood water than any other disaster in the United States. Why do you think that is? They take chances they shouldn't take. And a lot of that is what we call in Tennessee is, hey, y'all, watch this. <laughs> I can make that. <laughs> and what's aggravating about it is we have to put our first responders at life's risk to go pull these people off the rooftops of their cars. And they don't realize this, but it's going to come to a, a point, and as a matter of fact, it already has, where they're going to start getting charged for it. Uh, it actually started out west, and this is true fact. I'm not making this up. They, they have legislated what they call an idiot law. <laughs> Let me explain. If you drive down the road and there's a barricade that says road closed, you go around it and you get stuck in floodwaters and we have to send a barrage of first responders to yank you out of high water. Like Jeff, what's his name? Jeff Fox, Jeff Fox Overworthy would say, if you go around a barricade in floodwater, you just might be an idiot. <laughs> so that's why they call it the idiot law because it's putting a lot of people at risk other than your complete lack of responsibility for other people around you. So um, anyway, rule of being safe, head for high ground, stay away from floodwaters. If you come up across high water across the road, report it. Um, we have an automated system now where we're collecting data with uh, sheriffs, uh, police officers in the field, uh, EMS, fire, emergency management. We have a system that when we input data, it's going to populate on a, uh, on a map, and the general public will be able to have access to the map, and they'll be able to see live streaming what roads are closed. And that's just telling you that these are areas you need to stay away from. Just last week, with that rain we had, we had 11 roads that were closed. And typically, most of them are our normal problematic areas. What we have a lot of in Rutherford County is because we're still kind of old backwoods kind of people. And we have these slabs. Yeah, it's actually called a slab, which is a road going across a creek. Uh, but uh, we have a little rain. It's no longer a creek. It's a raging river. And the slab is two or three feet under water. It happens all the time. Uh, Except for heat-related fatalities, more deaths occur from flooding than any other natural hazard. Most people fail to realize the power of water. Now, what do we mean when we talk about the power of water? Six inches, only six inches of fast-moving water can knock you off your feet. Twelve inches can move your car. And you might, you might be able to see, oh, well, I can see on the side of the road where that mailbox is. It's only up 12 inches. I can and then the next thing you know, why's my, why's my car moving sideways? Ooh, this is interesting. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 24 inches can wash most vehicles cleanly away. And I'm, and I'm talking even large trucks. Uh, May of this year, we have a tractor trailer to try to make it didn't. It was stuck in the water for six days before it could receive before we could pull it out. And guess what it was full of? Well, by the time we got it out, it was stinky rotten food. Yeah. <laughs> because the reefer on it stopped running and the food was no longer cooled and it was sitting in eight feet of water. Also a big issue is washouts. 
when there's just a couple of inches across the road, you may think you'd be able to pass over it with no problem. But a lot of these washouts, you cannot physically see. And so you're not going to know if you're going to make a clearance across a flooded road or if you're going to drop down into a 12-foot hole. This is off of uh, Highway 96 in Murphy County just a couple of years ago. That's about a 12-foot hole. Uh, nearly half of all flash flood fatalities are vehicle related. We have a program called Turn Around, Dump the Ground. So again, if you see water across the flooded road, don't take a chance. Turn around, take an alternate route. If it's not barricaded yet, call the sheriff's office or the local authorities, whether you're in Murfreesboro or Smyrna, Laverne, or if you're in Davidson County or wherever you are, call and say, hey, I'm a so-and-so and so-and-so, there's water across the road, somebody needs to block this off. Because responders may not have run across it yet or seen it yet. We're not aware of everything that goes, that goes on until we drive up on it. Now again, like I said, we have typical problematic areas in Rutherford County that we go to first, like those slabs. <laughs> but we know when it's getting bad in Rutherford County because the slabs tell the story. But a lot of times we may get caught off guard because it depends on where these fronts come in and stall and dump water. We're on a karst system in Rutherford County. And I don't know if you're familiar with what a karst is, but essentially Tennessee sits on a vast underwater cave system all the way across the state. It's called karst. And a lot of our flooding issues are that these systems fill up full of water with severe torrential rain and then they come up from underground and there's no place for the water to run off. So it goes up and out and these areas flood and it's very difficult to get it to move off. Or, is that me? No, somebody else sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry I went a little bit over here but I've got a lot of information. Um, so again, like I said, do we uh, warn you to evacuate, please leave. Um, stay off the phone unless you have an immediate life safety issue my friend is dying and his leg is cut off he's having a heart attack whatever call 911 if if you have if you're involved in a disaster of any kind a fire a hazardous material a flood a tornado if you do not have an immediate life safety issue do not call 911 because the first thing that's going to happen is the cell towers are going to get flooded and they're going to shut down. Need y'all aren't going to get it. Does that make sense? It's very important. Yes, ma'am. So you just said stay off the phone and you mentioned cell towers. With that incident that happened in December of last year, when a lot of our cells were off, how, how, what is the next step to where you don't have a cell or because you know, what happened December of, of last year, it knocked a whole lot of stuff out. How did you, how did your area respond to that? Well, we have satellite technology that can, uh, that can allow us to get internet connectivity and public safety. We can communicate and coordinate via internet through a satellite. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the possibility that texting on the cell network works on a completely different bandwidth than cell phones do. So odds are much, much higher in a disaster. If you need help, you can text it before you can make a phone call. So try thing that we're doing in the emergency operations center is doing what we call social media monitoring. And we're looking for stuff like that. Historically, over the last few decades, there's event after event after event that's been documented where responders have sent help based on somebody saying, I'm trapped in my house and I can't get out. Text, not phone call, text. Yes, sir. So can you dial 911 from your cell phone? I don't know that. Can you text? Yes. You can text it? Are you, are you asking? No, you, you can't text, text it. it. You can't text it. You but can, can dial it. You can't text it. But can you dial one nine nine one one? Yeah. Yes. 
sending it that from your cell phone. Yes, yeah, so you can dial it, but you cannot text 911. Okay. Well, the reason why I'm asking is like what you had said earlier as for if you're driving and you come to an area that's flooded and they let the you know, respond to the police, that's why I'm asking, can you call the police if you come across an area that's severely flooded? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Uh, depending on what phone you got, hey, Google, call Rutherford County Sheriff's Department. Okay. Hey, Google, call Murfreesboro Police Department. Got gotcha. you. And then they'll, and, and what it does is, People might not know how cell phones work when they dial 911. Typically what happens is it will connect you through the closest tower. And the closest tower will tell the jurisdiction which PSAP or public safety answering point dispatch center that your call goes to. Sometimes they get switched because it might be on the border, which is why our departments uh, cohesively work together so much. The uh, sheriff's department might get a call and say uh, blah, 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 blah and then they'll call the Murfreesboro Police Department and say, hey, we just got this call, but it's it's in the city, not in the county. And so the city will pick it up. Yes? Tim, can I just clarify? So I'm on the road, I see water, I need to report it. I do not call 911, I call the Sheriff Department. Well, yeah, you can call directly or 911. Okay. Yeah, um, it, it depends. Now, if, if you have the availability to a non-emergency number, we would much rather you do that, but typically when you call, Davidson County has a separate number for that. It's a, it's a non-emergency number. But if you call the non-emergency number, it goes into dispatch anyway. So, and, it, and it's, it's, it's an emergency. If you run across a flooded street and it's not marked or barricaded, you know, we want to get out there and get it taken care of really quickly. Yes. Um, some 911 centers do have text capability to get them. I, I don't think Rutherford has it, but I know that there are some, so when it really goes down. And then, can you speak to about ham radio operators? How you pair with them in a disaster? Yeah, uh, in our communications piece under ESF2, communications, uh, we're also supported by an organization called ARIES, which is Amateur uh, Emergency Radio Services. Uh, they're ham radio operators. We have uh, an, uh, communications operations uh, uh, capability for them at the EOC. We also have them in various uh, 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 locations throughout the county, uh, including our hospitals, all the way from local, all the way up to the state level, and all the way up to the federal level, where if we have to and we have a national emergency, we can transmit not only communications, but data as well all the way across the United States using the ham radio capability. So they're huge. They're rarely ever used, but that's a good thing, but they're a great resource to be able to have. Do you have a question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, drought monitor, we're doing good now, uh, but we have been through rounds of drought in Rutherford County. Um, I've got to kind of pick this up because I'm running. Is there somebody supposed to speak, speak it through? There's someone standing for three, but he's, I'm sure, at a booth right now. Okay. All right. Because I wasn't sure how long I was supposed to do this, so <laughs> I've got more information than you probably care to get with that. I'll tell you what, um, let me just go on down here to really quick. Public health emergencies, which we're in the middle of now. Getting lots of experience with that. So, winter storms, how do you prepare? Everybody knows you go out and get <laughs> milk and bread. All right, good with that. <laughs> and toilet paper. Paper towels. <laughs> <That's good>. Right. <laughs> um, utilities can be lost. We typically don't have severe winter weather here anymore. I know it's, it's e easy to happen, it's prone to happen when the right conditions exist. Our biggest problem here is not so much snow, but ice. When we have ice storms, infrastructure falls, power lines go down, you can lose electricity. It's been across the state. We've been lucky here in Rutherford County lately, uh, but from Chattanooga all the way over to West Tennessee where they've had some severe thunderstorms or uh, ice storms and people have been without electricity for weeks. Uh, we sent resources up in Kentucky back a couple of years ago and they were out of electricity for months. Uh, so it just depends on what hits, when it hits, and, and the timing of the storm.
typically it starts to rain, then it freezes overnight, and then it starts to add up, and utilities can't handle the weight, and trees come down, power lines come down. So uh, do you have generators at your house? Is that something that you want to do? Is there a mitigative action that you can utilize to have a generator on the outside of your structure and run the cords on the inside of where you need them? Uh, because you don't want to run a generator inside of your house, do you? No. no. Okay, a little bit of problem with carbon monoxide, right? Um, extra blankets, camp stoves, propane heaters, gas heaters. Uh, one of the luxuries of my house is I've, I've got LP gas on the outside, so if my electricity goes out, I've got a gas stove I can cook on. I've got a gas fireplace for heat. Uh, so there, there are things like that, that that you can look at or utilize. If we're having a water shortage, you're anticipating that, fill a bathtub full of water. That's extra water for you. Um, there are all kinds of things that you can find online that will help you with these preparedness measures. Can I add something to that? Sure. Um, we lived in Houston, and we did a lot of emergency preparedness classes. If you fill up your bathtub, if you have Vaseline, put a little bit of the seal around it before you do it, and put down plastic, like plastic wrap or something, and then start your water because every bathtub will have a slow leak in it. That's a good point. Very good point. Yeah, that's cool. You can actually use the water that's in your tank as well. I would boil it, but it's just as clean as the water coming out of your tap. It's water coming out of, same t tap water coming out of your kitchen sink that's going into your toilet bowl. But if you put those chemical things in there, like the little blue things to make your water all pretty and sparkly, you don't want to drink that water. Uh, sheltering in place, I need to touch on real quickly. Shelter in place uh, typically comes out of a hazardous materials event. You may hear this from public safety authorities. If we have an event where there's an off-site rele release of a hazard that could potentially expose you to something that may be dangerous to your health, uh, we may issue a shelter in place order, which means we want, and we'll give these orders, uh, we will want you to stay in place, shut your doors and windows, lock them so nobody can get in or out, uh, turn off your HVAC systems or your heating and cooling, and go to an interior room and shut the door and stay there until you get it all clear from public safety officials. We're telling you to do this because there's a specific hazard that may be driving towards your location and it may be too dangerous or more dangerous for us to tell you, hey, run outside, get in your car, and drive away and evacuate. Because we don't want you to inhale or be exposed to anything that may be outside. It may be safer for you to stay inside. So that's why the shelter in place work. Evacuation comes different. Typically, when we're dealing with hazmat, will immediately shelter in place anyone who is downwind of the product, and then we'll start evacuating people in the rest of the 360 degree circle in case, well, it's Tennessee and the wind changes. <laughs> um, I've been on multiple events where we may have it going this way, and then an hour later it's going that way, and then an hour later it's going that way again. Um, so, and then, once it's safe enough for the people that are downwind, we'll evacuate them as well. And that, that happened out in the county when that truck was deploying to dump Yes, we had, a, we had a truck that was towing a trailer in the middle of the night, and he lost containment of it, and for some other reason, he didn't know it happened, or whatever reason, he just left it in the middle of the interstate tractor trailer didn't know it was there until they got about six feet on top of it and overcorrected and crashed into the median, followed by another tractor trailer truck that tried to avoid it and crashed into the wood line on the other side. Uh, the driver was deceased and the truck caught on fire and it was carrying uh, chlorine and a lot of other it was carrying 12 different items of hazardous materials, all that were incompatible with each other, and it was on fire. And we evacuated the Cannon States. Well, at first we sheltered in place. We had the 
downwind consideration, I'm getting too deep into this, but the downwind considerations for this were only half a mile. As a precursor, we extended it to one mile to be on the safe side. And we sheltered in place the community uh, because it was safe at that point. But once we reached the conundrum of nothing we were trying was putting the fire out, we knew we were going to have to put water on it. And putting water on this type of chemical fire was going to produce a larger plume and a larger area of concern. So that gave us time to go ahead and evacuate that area and make it safe. Then we could put water on it and not have to worry about the downwind hazard. So that that was a difficult. But that shelter in place comes is that through the emergency broadcast system, or how do you let people? It comes on on several different modes. It could be a fire truck going through your neighborhood. It could be police door to door. Um, it could be alert Rutherford and. Uh, Given at the back, I've got some pamphlets that he's handed out. Um, on the pamphlets, there's a little emblem called Alert Rutherford that you can sign up for. It's it's another app that you can have, or any other app that you can use as well. But Alert Rutherford, you can sign up for, and you can get emergency information for anything that you choose to get information for. Severe thunderstorm warnings, watches, tornado warnings. We we. Uh, we don't, uh, hazardous materials events, things of that sort. We don't do uh, Amber Alerts, that's a Tennessee Bureau of Investigation responsibility. We also do an item called IPALS, which is the Integrated Public Alert Warning System. It's a federal system um, that we can send out WIA and EAS messaging on, which goes through the National Weather Service on the EBS network. It can broadcast across radio, television, and your cell phone. So if Aunt Mary is driving into Rutherford County, or on her way to Florida, and she's driving from Illinois, and I've got an aero, uh, area that's geocached with this warning, if she drives into the warning area, she gets the warning on her cell phone. So, uh, this is an example of what uh, an incident would look like. So. In this highlighted area would be your shelter in place, and then the rest of the continuous circle around would be evacuated. Uh, sheltering in place at home, a hit on that. It's pretty much the same in business. Um, this real quick. Yeah, back in the early 1970s in Rome County, they had to evacuate because there was a train derailed that. Train derailment is a different animal uh, because typically, when you look at the standard highway transport, we're looking at anywhere from seven to 11,000 gallons of product, and we're looking at rail uh, all the way up to 38,000 gallons of product. So the complexity becomes more intense, and the need for a wider area of concern becomes an issue. Plus our tier two facilities. Uh, we've got, 168 tier two facilities in Rutherford County, and these are facilities that work with, manufacture, and transport reportable quantities of hazardous materials on a daily basis. And some of these uh, have a vast amount of materials that would require a large, it's another acronym, EPZ, or emergency planning zone, if they had an off-site release. Your preparedness, just real quick, and I'll get out of here. Um, make a review, a checklist of your potential needs. Gather supplies that are listed. Place supplies you most likely need for emergency in an easy to carry container, uh, a Rubbermaid container, backpack, suitcase, whatever the case may be. Uh, basics, you should stop for your go kit. Water, food, first aid, supplies, clothing, cash. That's a big one. If we have a big disaster, you might not be able to drive to an ATM and get anything out. Electricity's out. Um, uh, anything from covered trash containers, camping backpacks, duffel bags, Tupperware style containers. Uh, changes of clothes, blankets, personal hygiene items, uh, medical information, that's huge, okay? Prescriptions that you t typically need. Um, emergency contact information. Uh, 
extra eyeglasses. I hate to lose these in a disaster because I'm <laughs> which way up? <laughs> uh, non perishable snacks, first aid kit, flashlight, anything that you think is essential that you need to put in there. Online, there's a vast plethora of stuff you can look at. You can go as far as just getting a standard $25 first aid kit, all the way up to a $60 first aid kit with lots of bells and whistles, and, uh, and go even further up to a $500 uh, medical first responder kit. It just depends on what your abilities are and what you think you need. Um, we suggest supplies again for a minimum of 72 hours per person. So if you're thinking water and food uh, and essential items just for me, that's easy. But if you've got a family of five, that, that takes a little bit more thought process. Or pets. Or, or, pets. or, or pets. Yeah, dog food, water, all that good stuff. Um, talk about prescriptions, talk about three days. Uh, uh, stuff for infants, food, clothing, medicine, diapers, uh, extra food and water for animals, prescription drugs and glasses, hearing aids for the elderly. Uh, preparedness kits are all over the place. Um, Generators, solar panels, all the way up to large scale generacs that you can get for your houses. Solar uh, power, alternative light sources are important. Uh, alternative cooking sources you could always consider because it may come to that one day. You never know. Um, food in an emergency. Um, Everybody's got different dietary restrictions and, and needs. Uh, for instance, a male uh, requires more calories than a female does on a regular basis. So you need to look at your daily caloric intake on the minimum amount of calories you need to consume per day to sustain your comfort through a disaster. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's called an ER bar. Uh, it has, uh, it's 27 at each, 27 ounce bar contains nine individual 410 calorie rations for a total of 3,690 calories. It's recommended to consume three rations per day. Uh, you can get 60 of them for $4.09 and they have a shelf life of like six years. How do they taste? They're not bad. <laughs> when I'm hungry, I'll eat anything. <laughs> So for about ninety dollars, two two adults can eat for twenty days with these. You can spend a lot of money on prepared meals, but you want to look at particulars. Uh, one of these packets will cost you one hundred and fifty bucks. That's six sixty three meal a day, uh, twenty days for two adults. But also you want to look at the issue of the calories. These are only 348 calories per serving. Tim's losing a lot of weight with this diet. Um, so that only gives you 1,044 calories a day, when I'm typically about 2,500 to 3,000 calories a day, the way I eat. I'm still an old man too, so. <laughs> um, also the issue with these is that, I got it on here. Wait, what does it say on the left hand corner top? Oh, legacy? Legacy. Yeah. Uh, one of the biggest issues is that the majority of these pre uh, prepared meals come with an exorbitantly high amount of sodium, which makes you thirsty, makes you consume more water, things of that sort. So, um, all the way up to the fun stuff, which is uh, the Wise Company uh, makes servings for long term emergency supply. A three month supply for four adults will cost you twenty two hundred dollars. Just depends on whether you want to be a prepper or not. Yeah. Or how many times can you eat at McDonald's? <laughs> if McDonald's is open. If they're open, yeah. Um, so like here there's dietary requirements and you gotta you gotta look at the fine print because although that sounds like a deal for for, for three months, 
Again, when you're looking at caloric content for one meal, it's only 330 calories. You know what that is? That's a lean cuisine. I don't know how many of you can survive on lean cuisine because I've been doing that diet lately and I've told my friends at work, I know why people lose weight eating this because this is an appetizer. <laughs> Can I add something to that too? When yes. you have things like that, you've also really got to look at your water supply because a lot of that will, will require a lot of water. Absolutely. And there are some good companies out there that are, are not going to price gouge it, but, they're hard, but if anybody wants to know, they can talk to me. Right. Um, one of my recommendations is foodstuffs. You may get tired of it, but you don't know how long you're going to be eating this stuff. Canned food or uh, jarred food yep. will last one to two years. Uh, beans, rice, uh, indefinite to 10 years. Canned food, two to five years. Uh, Eagle Brain condensed milk, one year. Uh, instant dry milk, 20 years. Most freeze dried fruits and veggies, 25 years, okay? If you've got a food dehydrator, you're a prepper's dream because you can make all the stuff you want and put it in plastic bags and stick it in your storm shelter and you'll be good. <laughs> and, and just give you a calendar and say, oh, well, it's coming up to six months. I think I'll get to some of my supply and put some fresh in and eat some of that trail mix that I made about six months ago. <laughs> rotate. Yes, rotate. Water. Um, it is recommended one gallon of water per person per day. Okay, so again, one person, that's not bad, but you got a family, this is where you got to start uh, being concerned about storing enough water. And that is, there, that is only for drinking, it's not for cooking or flushing. Well, yeah, we're looking at, the recommendation is that one gallon, half of it is for drinking, half of it is for personal hygiene, so brushing your teeth. Uh, taking uh, a, what we call a camp bath, where you just get a paper towel and a little bit of soap and just scrub yourself down and say, how does it smell now? <laughs> <laughs> um, before storing water, treat it with a preservative such as chlorine bleach. It's recommended four drops of chlorine, regular sodium hypochlorite, the chlorine that you do with your laundry, uh, four drops per quart of water. Uh, you can put them in sealed containers, rotate those out every six months. Uh, boiling is the safest method. Um, you can bring water to a rolling boil for 10 minutes. Typically three minutes will do it. 10 minutes, you're golden, that's for sure. Um, it will taste better if you're oxygenated by pouring it back and forth into containers um, after, after you do boil it, because it, it can get kind of stale. Water purification with bleach again. Uh, two drops of chlorine in a quarter of water, or four drops uh, if the water is cloudy, or up to 10 drops per gallon, stir and let sit for, for 30 minutes. So if I were you uh, in your preparedness kits, I would make notes and put them into your kits so you can remember it, because this is hard to remember sometimes. But make, make like a little emergency notebook of uh, items that you have, items that you need, and and how to do things. And water purification should be at the top of your list. Even, it wouldn't even help that uh, in your safe room that you keep a couple of gallons of bleach just so you can purify water with it. Gotta make sure it's not the kind that's got fragrance in it. Pardon me? <laughs> not the kind that's got fragrance in it. Yeah. Yeah, just pure bleach, not the Yeah, pure bleach, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't want to like the, uh, um, the gel, just standard standard household bleach. Now, they used to only recommend Clorox because a lot of the other off-brands have l more lead in it. Is that still true? That I have, not heard. I have not heard. But there are other options, too. You can use uh, iodine uh, cleansers. You can use uh, water purification filter systems that are available. You can use alternative brand collection systems. Um, storage is, is, is where, or just where, where you, I would not recommend the putting in your car because cold can impact the integrity 
and the longevity of the package just as well as heat can. It's not recommended for that. I would try to keep it in a, a room that's out of light and a constant temperature throughout the year. Uh, we talked about alert Rutherford a little bit at iPaws. Um, if you don't have apps, get apps. There, like I said before, there's no reason for you not to be informed when we have severe weather, any kind of emergency events going on. Uh, make sure that the emergency alerts section in your phone are activated so you can receive alerts on your phones. Uh, social media, like I said before, we do monitor that. Uh, Rutherford County Emergency Management can be found on Facebook as well as on Twitter. Uh, we don't communicate with the public um, at all on Twitter. We'll post stuff uh, a lot on Facebook, especially when we do briefings with the National Weather Service and we're expecting severe weather, we'll post things of that sort. We do not post emergency weather information like, hey, tornado's coming on our Facebook site because that requires a lot of logistics and somebody working 24 seven. And that's the responsibility of the National Weather Service. But we will post briefings that we get with the Weather Service on anticipated severe weather that may be inspect, uh, uh, expected within the area that's coming up. Any questions? What's an emergency Ro Rutherford or Rutherford emergency? That app? Uh, alert Rutherford. Yeah, um, it's Alert Rutherford okay. is the app, yeah. So any questions to our website? If you just Google Rutherford County Emergency Management, if you come under the bottom here and click on emergency preparedness, everything and more that I've talked about today, you can find in there, um, all the way from, you know, the water purification and preparedness and, and all that good stuff. So, any questions? Great. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.